Hello everyone. This presentation is about hemodynamics. I am Dr. Partha Sarathi Sinha, a postgraduate trainee in the Department of Physiology, Badwar Medical College and Hospital. Now coming to the hemodynamics. Hemodynamics is the term consists of two parts. One is hemo, second one is dynamics. So hemodynamics is concerned with the dynamics of blood flow. In this presentation, we will discuss about the physical study of the flowing blood and of all the solid structures such as arteries through which it flows. Also, we will discuss about the modifications of the structures of different parts of the circulation and factors or laws that govern the flow of blood through the circulatory system. Now, before going into the actual discussion, we need to know about some basic things. Like the rate of the blood flow through different tissues is controlled mainly by tissue demands for nutrients. Blood flow to the kidney is far in excess of metabolic requirements and related to excretory function which requires filtration of large volume of blood. The heart and blood vessels are conditioned to provide the necessary cardiac output and arterial pressure for adequate tissue perfusion. Now, coming to the distribution of blood in the percentage of total blood in different parts. About 84% of blood is in the systemic circulation, as we can see on the figure, and the rest in pulmonary circuit. In the systemic circulation, 64% is in the veins, 13% in arteries, and 7% in arterioles and capillaries. Now coming to the arteries. As you see from the figure, the walls of all the arteries have an outer layer of connective tissue that is called the adventitia. Next layer, the middle layer of smooth muscle that is called the media and the inner layer which is called the intima. The intima is made up of endothelium and underlying connective tissue. Outer and other large diameter arteries contain relatively large amount of elastic tissue in inner and external elastic laminas. They stretch in systole and recoil on blood in diastole. Now the second thing that is the arterioles. Arterial wall contains less elastic tissue but more smooth muscle. The muscle is innervated by the noradrenergic nerve fibers which are constrictors and sometimes cholinergic fibers, which are dilators. Arterioles are the major sites of resistance to blood flow, and small changes in caliber cause blood changes in total peripheral resistance. For the capillaries, the arterioles divide into small muscle world vessels, which are called the meta arterioles, which feed into the capillaries. The openings of capillaries at arterial end is surrounded by smooth muscle P capillary sphincters. These sphincters respond to vasoconstrictors. Now, the capillaries are 5 micrometer in diameter at the arterial end and 10 micrometer in diameter at the venous end. When the sphincters are dilated, it just allows the RBC to squeeze through in a single size. The capillary walls which are one micrometer thick, are made up of a single layer of endothelial cells. In the muscle cells, the junction between the endothelial cells permit passage of molecules up to 10 nanometer in diameter. And also certain substances are transported across the endothelial cells by vesicular transport. Now this uh, table shows the conductivity and the different types of endothelium in different organs of the body. In the brain, the junction between endothelial cells are tighter and allow transport of smaller molecules. So the conductivity is low. This is um, depicted in the figure. It is 3. In most endocrine glands, intestinal villi and parts of kidney, there are gaps between the endothelial cells, which are called fenestrations, which allow passage of larger molecules. 
Whereas in liver, sinusoidal capillaries are still more porous and allow passage of still larger molecules. So you can see from the table, the GIT conductivity and the glomerulus in kidney conductivity are, are larger because they are fenestrated. Uh, lastly, the capillaries and postcapillary venules have perifice around endothelial cells, which are contractile and release vasoactive substances. You can see from the figure that is the perifite uh, around the endothelial cells. They appear to regulate flow through the junctions between the endothelial cells, especially in the inflammation. Now coming to the veins. We know that the walls of the veins are slightly thicker than capillaries. Though, uh, though they contain uh, relatively little smooth muscles, they are distensible. Considerable venification can be produced by noradrenergic stimulation and by circulating vasoconstrictors like endothelium. As the veins act as reservoirs of blood, so changes in vein stone is important in circulatory adjustment. These are called capacitance vessels. The intima of the veins are folded to form valves, which play a role in venous return against gravity. Uh, however, these valves are absent in very small veins, great veins, or veins from blood, brain and viscera. Now, come to some functional parts of the circulation. Venues drain blood from the capillaries and in turn coalesce into larger veins. Veins act as conduit for the transport of blood from venues to heart. They also serve as major reservoir of extra blood. In fingers, palms and earlobes, short channels connect arterioles to venues bypassing capillaries. These channels are called the arteriovenous anastomosis or shunts and have thick uh, muscular walls and are innervated by vasoconstrictor nerve fibers. Now since the veins are, veins are distensible, and a large amount of blood can be added to the venous system before veins are distended to the point where further increase in volume produces significant rise in venous pressure. So the veins are called the capacitance vessels. The small arteries and arterioles are referred to as resistance vessels as they are principal site of peripheral resistance. Now, following blood transfusion, less than 1%, it is distributed to arterial system which is, which is a high pressure system, while the rest is distributed in systemic veins, pulmonary circulation, and cardiac chambers, except the left ventricle, which is a low pressure system. Now, coming to the average velocity. What is that? When considering flow in a system of tubes, it is important to distinguish between velocity, which is V, Actually, velocity is the displacement per unit time, while flow, that is depicted as Q, which is the volume per unit time. Here, V equals to Q by A. A is the area of conduit. Now, from this equation, we can see that the, if the flow remains constant, the velocity is inversely proportional to the area of conduit, or total cross-section area at that point. Thus, the average velocity of blood is high in aorta and lowest in the capillaries. Here uh, in the table, you can see the different crosses and area, the different vessels in the body. The crosses and area is the highest in the capillaries and the lowest in the aorta. So, the crosses and area of a vein is about four times that of corresponding arteries. Since the capillaries are in parallel distribution, Transversal area of all capillaries are added together and thus becomes 1000 times that of aorta. And thus, from the um, given equation we have studied before, the velocity of blood in aorta is 1000 times that in capillaries. Here, uh, the blood pressure is depicted in various parts of the circulation. As the heart pumping is pulsed, right, systolic blood pressure is 120 millimeter of mercury 
while the astral is 80 mm under mercury we all know that pressure in the system arteries varies between 35 mm under mercury at the arterial end to 10 mm under mercury at the venous end the functional pressure in most vascular veins is 70 mm under mercury which is enough to allow little plasma leak and is sufficient for the transfer of nutrients so coming to the pulmonary research in pulmonary arteries the pressure is also pulsatile systolic pressure in the pulmonary artery is 25 mm mercury and diastolic pressure is 8 mm mercury mean pulmonary artery pressure is 16 mm mercury and the mean pulmonary capillary pressure is 7 mm of mercury low pressure in the pulmonary system serves the purpose as pulmonary system is required only for exposing pulmonary capillary blood to oxygen and alveoli now uh, the following at the basic principles of circulatory function first is that the blood flow to most tissues is controlled according to the tissue need uh, we know that occasionally active tissues may need blood flow 20 to 30 times the resting level the heart at test can increase cardiac output 4 to 7 times the resting level so you can see that it is not possible simply to increase blood flow everywhere in the body when a particular tissue demands increased flow instead micro vessels of each tissue continuously monitor tissue requirements of oxygen nutrients carbon dioxide and waste products and that di- act directly on local blood vessels to constrict or dilate them to monitor blood flow the central nervous system and hormones also act to control the tissue flow second is the that the cardiac output is a sum of all the local tissue flows the heart responds by increasing pumping when more blood returns to the heart from tissues the increased blood supply being necessitated by increased tissue demand at times however special nerve signals to the heart are responsible for maintaining this increased cardiac output. the third that is the arterial pressure regulation is generally independent of either local blood flow control or cardiac output control the circulatory system is provided with an extensive system for controlling the arterial blood pressure for instance if at any time the pressure falls significantly below the normal level of about 100 mm mercury within seconds a barrage of nervous reflexes It is a series of circulatory changes to raise the pressure back towards normal. Arterial pressure regulation is done by nerve signals that first increase the force of heart pumping and second contract the large venous reservoirs to increase the return of blood to the heart. And thirdly, cause constriction of arteries throughout the body. Here, kidneys also may play a major role in controlling blood pressure, mainly through the RAS system or renal angiotensin aldosterone axis. Now coming to the dynamics of the blood. First is the flow pressure and resistance relationship. The relationship between the mean flow, mean pressure and resistance in the blood vessels is analogous to the current, electromotive force and resistance, like is the Ohm's law. Here we know that current I equals to electromotive force E by divided by the resistance R. and also flow we you know it is a pressure by resistance so e equals to i into r that is the ohms law actually and p equals to f into r flow in any part of the vascular system is equal to the effective perfusion pressure in the portion divided by the resistance and effective perfusion pressure is the difference between the mean intraluminal pressure at arterial and the venous end that is p1 minus p2 uh blood flow can be measured by the flow meters which are electromagnetic or ultrasonic doppler flow meters indirect methods are also used like to measure the blood flow by the fixed me- method kt nitrous oxide method for cerebral flow clearance of the peyronie hip uric acid ph for inner blood flow and also plethysmography for blood flow in the is uh, used in the ex- for extremities
Now coming to the resistance and conductance. And you should know what is resistance and what is conductance. The resistance is impediment to the blood flow in the vessel. While conductance is a measure of blood flow through a vessel for a given pressure difference. So it is evident that the conductance is the exact reciprocal resistance in accord with the following equation. Conductance equals to 1 by resistance. So slight changes in caliber of vessel causes tremendous changes in the conductance of blood. In the figure we can see that the diameter of first, second and fourth causes profound changes in conductance. The difference in diameter causes profound changes in conductance. Now coming to the resistance to blood flow. There are type two types of circuit in the body, the series circuit and the parallel circuit. First coming to the in series circuit. The arterioles, arteries, capillaries, venules and veins are collectively arranged in series. In series, flow through each blood vessel is the same and total resistance is equal to the sum of the resistances. Like R total equals to R1 plus R2 plus R3 and so on. The total pressure of blood flow resistance is therefore equal to the sum of the resistance. As you can see. But in the parallel circuit, the blood vessels branch extensively to form parallel circuits to supply organs and tissues of the body. Here the total resistance is calculated as follows, 1 by R total equals to 1 by R1 plus 1 by R2 plus 1 by R3 and so on. So we can see that the parallel arrangement permits each tissue to regulate its own blood flow independently of the flow to the other tissues. For a given pressure gradient, greater amount of blood would flow through this parallel system than through any of the individual vessels. The total resistance is far less than the resistance of any single blood vessel. In this system, adding more vessels to the circuit reduces the total vascular resistance. Brain, kidney, muscle, gastrointestinal, skin, and coronary circulation are arranged in parallel, and each contributes to overall conductance of system circulation. Now, we should know about the laminar flow. Laminar flow is the type of motion in which the fluid moves as a series of individual layers, with each layer moving at a velocity different from that of its neighboring layers. The flow of blood in narrow straight vessels is normally laminar. Within the vessel, a thin layer of fluid in contact with the wall does not move, and the next layer at moves at a lower velocity, and the next at a higher velocity, etc. Uh, the velocity at the center of the stream is maximal and equal to the twice the mean velocity of flow across the entire cross section of the tube. You can see from the figure that the velocity at the center is the maximal and it gradually decreases as it approaches towards the wall. Now, another type of flow is the turbulent flow. Laminar flow can be distributed at branching points of arteries. It increases the possibility of deposition of atherosclerotic plaques. But constriction of an artery increases the velocity of blood flow through the constriction, producing turbulence and sound beyond constriction, which are um, brewing or colored cough sounds. Turbulent flow implies blood flows crosswise in the vessel and along it forming whorls in the blood, which are called the eddy currents. Now, we should know something about the critical velocity and Reynolds number. We have discussed about the laminar flow, but actually the laminar flow occurs at velocities up to a certain critical velocity. At or above this velocity, flow is turbulent. Now, the probability of turbulence, whether turbulence will occur or not, is estimated by this following equation. Re equals to rho dv by eta. Where rho is R D is the Reynolds number, rho is the density of fluid, D is the meter of the vessel, V is the velocity of the flow, and eta is the viscosity of the fluid. Now from this equation, if the R D or the Reynolds number is less than two thousand, 
the flow is usually not turbulent, but the turbulence will almost always be present when Reynolds number is more than 3000. High fluid densities, small tube diameters, high flow velocities, and low fluid viscosities predispose to turbulence. We can see from this equation. Now, coming to a formula which is called the Poiseuille Hagen formula. Poiseuille's law applies to the steady, which is non pulsatile, laminar flow of Newtonian fluids through the rigid cylindrical tubes. Now, the Newtonian fluid is one which, whose viscosity remains constant. In this uh, formula, we can see that F is equal to PA minus PB. PA minus PB equal to, is the pressure difference between the two ends of the T into pi by 8 into 1 by eta, eta is viscosity, into R to the power 4 by L, where R is the radius of the T and L, L is the length of the T. We already know that the pressure difference by the resistance, which is PA by P minus PB by R equals to the flow. Therefore, R is equal to 8 eta L by pi R to the power 4. Now, from this formula, we can see that uh, as the flow varies directly and resistance inversely with the fourth power of radius, small changes in the diameter of blood vessels has a profound effect on blood flow and resistance. We can calculate that a 19% 19, 19 increase in the radius would double the flow while doubling the radius will, would decrease the resistance to 6% of its previous value. The uh, viscosity actually depends on the hematocrit because a large number of suspended red blood cells in the blood, each of which exerts frictional drag against adjacent cells and against the wall of the vessels is responsible for the viscosity. So in polycythemia, hematocrit will be risen to 60 or 70 and viscosity becomes 10 times that of water resulting in the decrease of flow. Also either other minor factors affecting blood viscosity are types of protein in plasma and plasma protein concentration. And on the other hand, in marked anemia, peripheral resistance is decreased partly due to the decreased velocity. Now, the effect of the viscosity in vivo deviates from that is predicted by the poiseuille hagen formula. In large vessels, increase in hematocrit increases its viscosity. The smaller vessels, like in artery rolls, capillaries, and venules, change of viscosity per unit change of hematocrit is much less. This is due to the difference in the nature of flow through small vessels which is called a scheming effect, we will discuss that later. So, change in the hematocrit has relatively less effect on the peripheral resistance in the smaller vessels. Now, coming to the shear thinning. Before we know uh, the shear thinning, we should know about the shear stress and shear rate. What are these? For the shear stress, as the blood flows through a vessel, if it exerts a force on the vessels, which is parallel to the wall. This is called the shear stress. Shear stress is directly, directly proportional to the shear rate and viscosity. Now, shear rate is the rate of change in velocity at which one layer of fluid passes over an adjacent layer. The apparent viscosity of blood diminishes as the shear rate increased, which is called the shear thinning. The greater the amount of flow, the greater the rate that one lamina of fluid shears against, against an adjacent lamina. At high flow rate, RBCs occupy the central axis of the tube and move in the direction of flow. So the central portion is having the fastest flow. This leaves a relatively cell-free zone of plasma at the periphery. This phenomenon is called the plasma scheming, which occurs with decreased viscosity. Capillary uh, offshoots, like uh, is shown in the figure B, 
has blocked with plasma scheming and consequently decreased viscosity. Now we will discuss about the critical flows in pressure. The relationship between pressure and flow in thin walled blood vessels is nonlinear. When the pressure in these vessels is reduced, a point is reached when no blood flows even though the pressure is not zero. We can see from this figure that as it decreases the pressure at a point, the flow becomes zero, though the pressure is not zero at this point. Uh, at this point, which is, this point is called a critical frozen pressure. So, when intravenous pressure decreases, surrounding tissue pressure they collapse. In inactive tissue, where intravenous pressure is decreased due to constriction of precapillary sphincters and materials, capillaries collapse. Lastly, the law of Laplace. Uh, it is surprising that. Thin wall arteries are not prone to rupture. Principal reason for their invulnerability is explained by the law of Laplace. This law states that the tension T in the wall of a cylinder of vessel is equal to the product of transmural pressure or P and the radius R divided by the wall thickness. So T equals to P into R by W. The transmural pressure is pressure inside the cylinder minus the pressure outside the cylinder. As tissue pressure is low, it can be ignored and P equals to the pressure inside the viscous. In a thin wall viscous wall, thick, uh, the thickness W is negligible and in a cylinder as in the blood vessel, so it is T equals to P into R or P equals to T by R. As the smaller the radius of the blood vessel, lower the tension in the wall, necessary to balance the distending pressure, which leads to the rupture. Here, when the radius of the cardiac chamber is increased, which is occur in cardiac dilatation, a de increased tension must be developed in the myocardium to produce a given pressure, and a dilated heart must work harder than a non-dilated heart. By the same principle, smaller alveoli in the lungs tend to collapse by the surface uh, by surface tension which is prevented by the surface tent. So this is all about the hemodynamics in brief. Thank you.